Okay, welcome everyone. Today, we are proud to bring you Dr. Patty Ekikakis, Professor of Exercise Psychology at Iowa State University, Fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine and National Academy of Kinesiology. Dr. Ekikakis is an expert in affective responses to exercise and the implications for exercise behavior. He has delivered multiple workshops and taught multiple courses focused on critical appraisal and evidence-based practice. He's authored one book, edited two books, authored over 100 book chapters and articles, and he's also a wonderful mentor. Now, without further delay, Dr. Patty Ekikakis. Hello, everyone. So let me take the, uh, the mandatory couple of minutes to try and uh, share my screen here. <laughs> Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, thank you to Stork uh, for the invitation. Uh, thank you to everyone uh, who is taking time out of their day to attend. Um, I really appreciate it and I hope that I will keep you uh, entertained for the next hour. So as I go through my slides, um, I want us to remember that we are talking about the leading cause of disability in the world. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, Patty, we need to unmute you. Unmute, okay. Are no, we sorry about that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay, <laughs> that's okay. So we are talking about the, the uh, leading cause of disability. Um, I lost my slides now. Let me see if I can get them back. Okay, there we go. Um, the, the leading cause of disability in the world. So a, a lot of what I'm going to show you uh, might seem like a game uh, and might seem funny uh, at times, uh, but I would like you in the back of your mind to, to think that this is uh, very serious because we're talking about a very widespread disease uh, that is really debilitating. The second thing I wanted to uh, tell you is that I'm not a pro-exercise fanatic uh, when it comes to mental health. And in the past, I've been critical of some hyperbolic, uh, perhaps unfounded uh, conclusions in, in our field, the field of kinesiology, uh, when it comes to uh, statements about the, uh, the benefits of exercise for mental health. But I became interested in the topic uh, many years ago um, and I've written about this. So if anybody is interested in finding out more, uh, you can go to my website and you can read other uh, papers about it. Today, uh, we're going to focus on the critical appraisal of meta-analyses. And in particular, we're going to start from a meta-analysis that has been tremendously uh, influential, published 20 years ago now, it came out in March of 2001. This was a meta-analysis by <clears throat> Debbie Lawler and Stephen Hopker from uh, <clears throat> Bristol. Uh, the meta-analysis, as I'm gonna show you, has been cited extensively. Uh, and since 2001, it has generated a series of Cochrane reviews with two revisions so far in 2009 and 2013 as well as a uh, series of additional updated meta-analyses in 2011, 2017. Because I have written about the Cochrane uh, reviews previously, today we're going to focus on the original, the Lawler and Hopker. Sometimes I might refer to it as the first meta-analysis and then a uh, second meta-analysis uh, involving uh, Debbie Lawler and um, researchers from the University of Copenhagen, uh, led by a psychiatrist by the name of uh, Jesper Crow, and then a uh, the latest uh, spin-off meta-analysis in 2017, also led by uh, Jesper Crow. So, what is the effect of exercise on depression? You can see here results from. Uh, six uh, meta-analysis published between 2015 to 2019 with different inclusion. We can't see your slides, Bob. 
Can, can we stop you? Yes. You're not showing your slides yet. We can't see your slides. Oh my goodness gracious. There we go. Perfect. I really apologize. I'm not a Zoom person. I'm a, I'm a WebEx person, as you can tell. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the effects of exercise on depression. So there have been uh, different uh, meta-analyses um, in recent years. This is one of the most extensively meta-analyzed uh, topics. Uh, different inclusion and exclusion criteria, so there's some variation in the effect size, but I think you can say um, that the effect, give or take, is large, um, approximately uh, 0 0.8, which compares favorably to the effects of psychotherapy uh, compared to similar uh, control groups, things like, for example, um, lectures and self-help uh, materials and, and things like that. Um, how about compared to antidepressants? So this is a little more complicated because most of the antidepressants have been compared to placebo, pill placebo, and we only have two uh, exercise trials comparing exercise to placebo. So the um, average effect from those two trials is 0 0.4, which is just slightly larger than the effects of exercise, uh, the effects of um, SSRIs or antidepressants on against placebo, uh, and larger than the effects of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy against placebo, with a giant caveat, again that we only have two exercise trials comparing exercise to placebo. But that gives you, uh, I think, um, a general impression about the uh, effects of exercise on depression. So in the original uh, Lohler and Hopker meta-analysis, the standardized mean difference was 1.1, uh, which was very large. But if you go back and you read that meta-analysis, you will see that the um, standardized mean difference was hardly mentioned. The emphasis was primarily on the extremely poor uh, methodological quality of the studies. So that the way that the meta-analysis was framed was actually that we don't have any evidence to suggest that exercise can be beneficial for placebo. In that issue of the British Medical Journal, in um, the table of contents, they usually have a little blurb um, about uh, each of the articles in the issue. And that particular article was presented with the title, Effectiveness of Exercise in Managing Depression is Not Shown in Meta-Analysis. In the follow-up meta-analysis in 2011, uh, where uh, the uh, researchers from uh, Bristol uh, collaborated with researchers from the University of Copenhagen. The uh, standardized mean difference was uh, 0 0.4. And the conclusion was that, as you can see, the available evidence does not support the use of exercise. Any effect of exercise is small at best and largely probably, probably uh, placebo in nature. And in the latest uh, meta-analysis in 2017, published in the British Medical Journal Open, uh, the uh, standardized mean difference was 0 0.66. And once again, the conclusion was there's currently no evidence in favor of exercise for patients with uh, depression. Each of these meta-analyses, as you can imagine, was accompanied by uh, a lot of uh, press releases and press interviews. Uh, in each case, the researchers claim that there is no evidence to suggest that exercise uh, can lower depression. 
um, either because the methodology of the trials is extremely poor or because when you look at the evidence with the highest scientific standards, uh, and that means if you restrict the analysis to studies with high methodological quality, which are only just a handful, then uh, there is no evidence that exercise uh, lowers uh, depression. So you can see here in a leading uh, Danish newspaper, uh, headlines like uh, common perception that exercise works against depression is wrong. As I mentioned earlier, uh, all three meta-analyses are relatively high profile. Of course, the Lawler and Hopter has been out for longer and has had the most impact. Uh, but needless to say, these are meta-analyses that have influenced uh, the view, especially within the medical literature about the effects of exercise on depression. Now, at this point, um, I tell my students, before you start uh, critically analyzing any article, you cannot go into this blind. You have to understand the, the political circumstances, the economic circumstances. You have to uh, know the controversies within the field because those can help you um, calibrate your level of scrutiny, how closely you're going to read the articles. So I had about 25 slides or so after this point to uh, help you understand why this is such a controversial and highly biased uh, area of research. But then I became worried about time. So I put the slides at the end and see if we, if we, have, we will have any time to get into the why question. Why is this uh, problem that I'm about to describe uh, happening? So let's start with the uh, Lawler and Hopker, the original meta-analysis. Now the uh, British Medical Journal has started publishing their reviews. So we actually can read the peer reviews um, that led to the acceptance of that meta-analysis. And of course, as you can imagine, the, the reviews are positive the work is of high standard, a well carried out systematic review and so on and so forth. What I'm going to show you is that there are some signs that steps were taken in the meta-analysis to accomplish uh, two goals. One was to attenuate the pooled standardized mean difference. And the second was to disparage or downgrade the methodological quality of the evidence. And I'm, because that was the emphasis in the article, it was a very poor methodological quality. I'm actually going to start from that, from the second uh, aim. So the uh, meta-analysis, like many others, uh, used three criteria to grade the methodological quality of the evidence. The first was whether randomization was adequately concealed. The second was whether the outcome assessors were blinded. And the third was whether the analysis were by intention to treat. To start with the uh, concealment, what you will see is that this meta-analysis published in 2001 used uh, the consort language as criteria, whether some of the standardized consort language um, to describe adequate concealment of allocation had been used. But keep in mind that the article, this review is coming out in 2001. So there were, there were only a few years since the publication of the first consort guidelines. So for those of us who were around at that time, that gap between 96 and 2000, you will remember that most of the journals <clears throat> had not really started implementing the consort guidelines at that point. So specifically regarding adequate concealment, perhaps what you might expect it is that most of the articles would be graded as unclear because the authors were not using the standardized consort uh, language at the time. And if you've ever tried to contact any original authors of, a, uh, of an RCT, then you know that very few respond let alone that some of the articles in the meta-analysis were master's thesis by people who then left the field and so on and so forth. So it would have been really difficult uh, to get a hold of them. 
When you look at the RCTs, what you find, not surprisingly, is that they use generic language uh, to describe randomization. They use the expression, participants were randomly assigned, and that's about the extent of it. They don't provide any additional information. So even though you would have expected to see a lot of unclear uh, designations, instead what you find in the article is that concealment was not uh, I'm sorry, randomization was not adequately uh, concealed, which was a very surprising uh, finding uh, if you uh, go back and you read the articles. So we subsequently found out uh, that at least in one case, the Blumenthal 99 randomized control trial, that wasn't true. Um, Blumenthal, found out because uh, the same um, assessments were carried over to the uh, first uh, Cochrane review, he discovered that his RCT had been graded as high risk of bias uh, in the category of uh, adequate concealment. And he contacted the uh, authors and said, no, our, our uh, randomization was adequately con concealed. So we know that, that at least that one designation was false. Uh, having spoken with uh, Jim Blumenthal, he does not recall ever uh, being contacted. How about uh, intention to treat analysis? So um, you know, I hope, what, what intention to treat analysis is. So this is from one of the RCTs that were reviewed. For patients who stopped treatment between week six and nine, their score at week nine was taken as being the same as their score at week six. So I think any reasonable reading of that sentence will tell you that the uh, authors, in this case, Egil Martinson, uh, used intention to treat analysis. But when you look at the assessment as to whether Martinson 85 had used intention to treat, the uh, designation was no. What about blinding of the outcome assessors? So here, uh, the uh, authors, uh, Lawler and Hopker, uh, decided that if the outcome, remember that we're talking about depression, which doesn't have a, a blood test or an imaging test to assess it, right? It's always measured by self-report of symptoms. They decided that if the original authors had used a questionnaire to measure depression, then automatically all of those trials, so we're talking about the majority, 10 or 14 trials they reviewed, would be designated as high risk um, of bias. So this is a somewhat controversial decision, as you can imagine, because <laughs> Like I said, we you always measure depression by self-report. So to say that if a questionnaire was used and automatically that means a high risk of bias, that sounds a little um, extreme. And I have to point out that that is not the norm. This is from a meta-analysis of psychotherapy trials by uh, Pim Kuipers. And in the psychotherapy world, uh, where they have the same problem as we have with exercise, in other words, people who exercise know that they're exercising, the participants themselves are not blinded to uh, uh, allocation. In the psychotherapy world, they have the same problem, but when the outcome in psychotherapy trials is assessed by self-report, then the meta-analysts assume that um, the outcome assessors were blinded. Now, a, an interesting complication here is what happens in the case of trials that use multiple measures to assess the outcome. In the depression literature, usually that means a questionnaire and a clinician administered checklist called the Hamilton rating scale for depression. So multiple trials actually assess the outcome of depression by both a questionnaire and the clinician administered uh, checklist. And some of them designated both as co-primary outcome measures. So this is an example. This is from the SING 97 uh, trial. They said we had two primary outcomes, 
the Beck Depression Inventory, which is a questionnaire, and the Hamilton Rating Scale for Depression. Well, in those cases, uh, Lawler and Hopker decided that whichever is mentioned first is the one that counts. So in this case, you can see that the BDI, which is a questionnaire, happened to be mentioned first. And because of that, the trial was graded as high risk of methodological bias because the uh, outcome assessors were not blinded. If you go back to uh, SYNC and look closely, you will see that both the questionnaire and the uh, clinician administered rating scale were administered by a blinded outcome assessor. Now, let's uh, switch from the assessment of methodological bias uh, to uh, the standardized mean difference. First issue, the simplest, is how data are entered and whether we can assume uh, data entry integrity. So in this case, a standard phrase that has been used is that two authors uh, at least uh, extracted and entered data independently. So that's the phrase that was used in the Lawler and Hopker meta-analysis. That's the phrase that was used in the subsequent Crow meta-analysis and so on and so forth. So let's take an example. So this is again from the same trial I showed you before, uh, SYNC 97. And if you've done a meta-analysis, then you know that this is sort of the best case scenario. Everything is so nice and clean and tidy. You can see the sample sizes of uh, the exercise and the control group, and you can see the post-intervention uh, means and standard deviations as clear as day. So if you enter those numbers, the effect size that you get from the SYNC trial is minus 1.75. And I don't think that there's a lot of room here to debate as to whether these are the right numbers. But then you look at the Lawler and Hopker meta-analysis and you see that the SYNC 97 uh, trial was entered with a standardized mean difference of 0 0.4. So clearly that was a mistake. The mistake was discovered um, during the 2009 uh, edition of the Cochrane review. So they actually entered the correct effect size for uh, the Cochrane review. Notice that one of the authors of the 2009 uh, Cochrane Systematic Review was Debbie Lawler. So uh, evidently, I, I have to assume that Debbie Lawler was informed that an error had been made uh, regarding this particular uh, RCT. In the uh, subsequent, however, uh, Crow and uh, Lawler meta-analysis, which was finally accepted in 2009. So that's after the Cochrane review, the SYNC trial was once again entered with the wrong uh, effect size of 0 0.44 instead of uh, 1.75. Uh, then we have the issue of um, inclusion exclusion criteria. So, the way that the uh, meta-analysis, the, uh, both the original uh, Lawler and Hopker and the subsequent Crow 2011 meta-analysis were framed is that they present results uh, comparing exercise to no treatment or some kind of neutral uh, control group. So let's take uh, one effect size that kind of stands out because as you can see, it's on the right hand side of the zero line. So that indicates that exercise was actually worse than no treatment, which is puzzling. What's the possible explanation for something like this? So the effect size was 0 0.24 against exercise. And this was transferred over to the subsequent chromat analysis as well, 0 0.24. And it was even transferred over to the latest 2017 uh, Crow meta-analysis, 0.24. So if you go back to the uh, Klein meta-analysis, uh, sorry, Klein RCT, what you discover is that um, there was no control group. There was actually a comparison between three anti-depression therapies. So the one that was selected as the uh, neutral inactive control group in the meta-analysis, all three of them, 
was actually described by the authors as meditation relaxation therapy. It was administered by uh, therapists uh, and by all indications in the article, it was considered to be an alternative uh, form uh, of therapy for depression. And in fact, that meditation relaxation therapy was a stress control intervention and it fared the best uh, of all the others, including group psychotherapy and running therapy. So that 0 0.24 uh, effect size against exercise was actually because um, this supposed neutral non-treatment form of therapy was more effective than running and more effective than group psychotherapy in that particular uh, trial. Then we have the issue of what do we do with the RCTs that have multiple uh, exercise arms? For example, there were three RCTs that had an aerobic arm and then a uh, non-aerobic or um, resistance exercise arm. That was uh, Nutri, that was Doin, and a uh, trial by Dr. Crow himself. It turns out that um, the effect sizes associated with the aerobic and non-aerobic intervention in Doin were identical. So we're not going to talk about Doin. We will talk about Nutri and Crow. So to resolve this dilemma, uh, Dr. Crow decided that they would pick at random whether to consider aerobic exercise as exercise or resistance exercise as exercise. They picked at random. And then they reassured the readers that in sensitivity analysis, they repeated the meta-analysis using the other option and it made no difference. So the new tree uh, RCT was entered with a uh, standardized mean difference of 0 0.96 and the Crow RCT was entered with a standardized mean difference of 0 0.25 against exercise. But if you go back and calculate the standardized mean differences for the other options, remember that Dr. Crow reassured us that it made no difference what you find is that in Nutri, if they had used the resistance arm um, instead of the aerobic arm, the effect size would have been minus 2.39. And in Crow, if they had used the resistance arm instead of the aerobic arm, then the effect size would have been in favor of exercise, albeit tiny, uh, as opposed to against exercise. The next question is what do we do in dose response studies where we have multiple doses of exercise? And Dr. Crow decided that we're going to use the arm that involved the strongest dose. So on surface, that might, might sound reasonable to enter the strongest dose until of course you realize that that's not how dose response studies always work. It's not always this, the strongest dose that's the best. Um, it could very well be that the strongest dose might be adverse or toxic. So it's not exactly sound logic, but things are even more complicated because this rule actually applied to only one dose response study and that was the study by Andrea Dunn. In that study, the design was kind of complicated. Notice that there were two doses. There was a low dose of physical activity, and there was a higher dose called the public health dose of physical activity. So the public health dose, as you can imagine, was close to the recommendation of approximately 150 minutes a week. But then to make things more complicated, each of these doses were administered either in three sessions per week or five sessions per week. So you can understand how somebody might get a little confused. So what the meta-analysts have done is as the strongest dose, they picked the public health dose over five days per week, which is not the strongest dose. 
the strongest dose was actually both over three days and over five days um, of the uh, uh, public health dose. So they did pick five days per week, a public health dose. Uh, and the mistake was discovered by Dr. Andrea Dunn, who sent a letter to the authors of the um, Cochrane Review in 2009. She explained, you're not reading my design correctly. Um, both the public health um, um, arms of the trial received the same dose. It's not that the five days a week <coughs> was a higher dose. Uh, so you need to correct it. But nevertheless, uh, the correction was not really made. So what happened was that uh, the meta-analysts entered the public health dose administered over five days a week, which had an effect size of 0 0.74, and not the public health dose over three days a week, which had a stronger effect size of 1.16 what happened in the public health dose administered over five days a week. Some of you who do exercise psychology research might already be thinking about it. Uh, participants had to drive to Dallas, Texas five days a week, which is a nightmare. So they had a lower adherence because people just didn't wanna uh, mess with the traffic. And that's why they had a lower effect size. Nevertheless, in the Crow trial, that's again what was entered as the strongest dose, even though that wasn't true. Now, can you go somehow lower than 0 0.74? Yes. So what happened in the 2017 edition of the uh, Crow meta-analysis is that they actually used as exercise, not the quote strongest dose, but the average effect across the multiple exercise doses. So that included the less effective low doses. And the overall average was 0 0.6. So they actually lowered the effect size associated with that trial from 0 0.74 initially to 0 0.6, as you can see here. Then we have another issue. What do we do with the RCTs in which both the exercise group and the comparator are receiving antidepressants at a rate of 100%? So as you can see in the Lawler and Hopker meta-analysis and the subsequent editions, they considered that those trials are actually directly comparable to exercise versus no treatment trials. I will explain that in a second. I just wanna show you that the exact same phrase was used in the 2011 meta-analysis and also the 2017 meta-analysis. So let's try to unpack what this means. So imagine that the treatment group receives antidepressants at 100% and the control group or comparator group receives antidepressants at 100%, but then, the treatment group also receives exercise in addition. In the meta-analysis, they considered that this is comparable to, directly comparable to, exercise versus no treatment. In other words, what they're assuming here is that there is a perfect 100% additive effect. If someone receives antidepressants and exercise, in essence, that would double uh, the treatment effect. And of course, you don't need to know too much about depression to know that that's totally not the case, right? We wish it were because then we would add two or three treatments on top of each other and we would have perfect treatment of depression, but it doesn't work this way. So why did they uh, constitute that rule? Well, to apply to a trial by Jim Blumenthal conducted at Duke, where they uh, compared the effects of a full regimen of Zoloft to a full regimen of exercise to a Zoloft plus exercise combination. And as you can see from our perspective, um, this is a positive result because it shows that uh, exercise, this is the exercise group, 
had exactly the same effect, non-significant difference uh, with the Zoloft group or the Zoloft plus exercise group. There was no difference. So by any reasonable interpretation of that trial, the results were positive in support of exercise. But the way that the trial was actually treated in the meta-analysis is that the Zoloft group was labeled the no treatment control group. And then the Zoloft plus exercise combination group was labeled as exercise and was entered in the meta-analysis leading to an effect size of zero. Zero meaning that exercise had absolutely uh, zero effect compared to quote, no treatment. The exact same treatment can be found in the Crow meta-analysis where somehow, I guess the means must have changed. So instead of 0.0, it was now 0.1. I hope you're, you're still following me. Now, let's focus on a key argument here. And the key argument is um, that the uh, trials are of such poor quality we cannot rely on them. The standardized mean difference means nothing. We have to focus on the trials that have a lower risk of bias. When you focus on that category in the Crow 2017 meta-analysis, what you find is that that category is actually made up of only four trials. Two of the trials were conducted by the lead author himself. And both of these trials actually yielded standardized mean differences against exercise. Exercise, in other words, had a lower effect uh, than the comparators, leading to the conclusion that uh, there is no evidence in favor of exercise when you restrict the analysis to only the high quality trials. So let's briefly look at the two Crow trials, because honestly, um, I've never seen this before. These appear to be two trials that were designed to show that exercise has no uh, benefit for depression. The first trial called the demo trial was a three arm trial. There was a strength training group, there was an aerobic training group, and there was a so-called relaxation comparator group. So what did the relaxation comparator group do? Well, the participants were told to avoid muscular contractions and they were told to do so by alternating between muscle contraction and relaxation. And they were also told to not stimulate the cardiovascular system above an RPE of 12. And what they actually did was that they did strength exercises on mattresses and played with medicine balls. For those of you who remember your ACSM guidelines, you will remember, of course, that an RPU of 12 corresponds to the moderate intensity uh, range of exercise. So the relaxation group actually probably received exercise, which is substantiated by the fitness assessments the relaxation group is shown here in red, and you can see that there were substantial gains in aerobic fitness and even more substantial gains in uh, strength measures, chest press, knee extension, leg press. So not surprisingly, since the quote relaxation group also received fitness benefits that were comparable to the exercise groups, what happened in depression was that the quote, relaxation group experienced reductions, very sizable reductions in depression that were comparable to the strength and aerobic exercise groups. The conclusion by Dr. Crow was that the trial showed no evidence for a biologically mediated effect of exercise on clinical depression, which is not supported by the evidence since, as you saw, the relaxation group, in fact, received uh, biological benefits from exercise. The DEMO2 trial, not surprisingly, was almost a copycat approach in which the uh, non-exercise group, in this case labeled a stretching group, in fact, received a lot of exercise. 
<clears throat> so I have the interventions here, both the quote aerobic exercise and the quote stretching group started with uh, biking as a warm up for 10 minutes. Then the aerobic group did biking for the rest of the time and then biking for another five minutes as a cool down. Whereas the quote stretching group did stretching for about 20 minutes and then played ball games, throwing and catching balls uh, for 10 minutes and then ended with biking for another five minutes. So in essence, what you have in this trial, like the previous one is a comparison of exercise versus uh, exercise. And uh, not surprisingly, the changes in depression uh, were uh, identical, uh, about an eight point reduction, which is considered a very meaningful uh, reduction in depression. Now, the reason why these trials evidently were conducted was so that they can be rated as high methodological quality. So in the Crow, the latest 2017 meta-analysis, there were three criteria of methodological quality like before. There was allocation concealment, there was blinding of the outcome assessors, and then there was intention to treat analyses. So let's start with the uh, Crow uh, studies. The DEMO-1 trial, for example, uh, did a centralized randomization, so check. Uh, the assessors were blinded, so check. And the analysis was by intention to treat, so check. The DEMO-2 trial, identical thing, randomization um, at a remote location, uh, blinding of the outcome assessors, intention to treat analysis. So when you look at the table of uh, the assessment of methodological quality, what you see is low risk of bias, low risk of bias, low risk of bias. Now, if you know this area, <laughs> you probably are already thinking, wait a minute, I know that there are more studies that did those things. So this is just a sample of other studies just off the top of my head. So this is from the Andrea Dunn trial that we mentioned earlier. Randomization was again, you know, uh, consistent with consort uh, guidelines, sequentially numbered envelopes, opaque, uh, sealed, uh, blinding of the outcome assessors, and read it with me, intention to treat analysis. This is from the Blumenthal 2007 trial, randomization centrally by computer, assessment by uh, a blinded uh, outcome assessor, and intention to treat analysis. My friend, uh, um, <laughs> Dr. Belvedere Muri in Italy, uh, the SEEDS trial, uh, randomization was um, offsite by computer, uh, the outcome assessor was blinded, and inten intention to treat analysis with last observation carried forward. But when you look at the assessment of these trials in the table of Dr. Crow, what you find is high risk of bias, high risk of bias, high risk of bias, specifically in the category of intention to treat analysis. And I just showed you that it couldn't be any more clear that the uh, authors of those RCTs actually performed intention to treat analyses. So in summary, um, what we're discussing here is a highly consequential issue it is very serious. Depression is the leading cause of disability in the world. We do need um, more treatments, especially scalable, low cost and safe treatments such as exercise. Depression is currently the only mental health disorder for which exercise is recommended in clinical practice guidelines. And um, one reason physicians give for not presently recommending exercise for depression is that when you ask them, they say, I'm not aware of any supporting evidence uh, indicating that exercise is beneficial for lowering depression. What did I just show you? Well, I'm not sure. Um, I, will, I will hear you to tell me what I just showed you. Uh, but from my uh, vantage point, I think I showed you at least that there is evidence of anti-exercise bias in these uh, meta-analyses, at least puzzling, um, disconcerting evidence. There is no indication, as far as I can tell, that medical experts can offer credible pre-publication peer review. Uh, this is why these meta-analyses are published. And in my mind, 
even more worrisome is the fact that there is no evidence that kinesiology experts are interested in post-publication peer review, considering the fact that none of the three meta-analyses that they just reviewed have received any extensive uh, critiques uh, by experts within the field of kinesiology. So um, just to uh, give you a one sentence answer as to why this is happening. The reason why this is happening is that in the last decade or so, we have had the inclusion of exercise as a treatment option for the treatment of depression, specifically within the British National Health Service. The British National Health Service is the highest profile, uh, most well-known uh, national healthcare system in the world. Their guidelines are the most detailed and thorough and meticulous guidelines anywhere in the world. So in my mind, if the inclusion of exercise within the NHS worked, if it was acceptable by the patients and the physicians, and if it was shown to be effective, then other national healthcare systems around the world would follow. So in essence, we have a very interesting uh, test case here what are the ramifications of introducing a potentially no cost treatment option that is at least as effective as the current for profit options within a national healthcare system what happens next what is the likely response and i've shown you only one aspect of that response and that is some very curious uh, reactions within the medical uh, research literature and with that, I'm going to stop and I'm going to open it up to questions. Thank you for uh, listening. All right, thank you very much. Um, Zach, do you want to ask questions or? Sure. Uh, okay. I'm, I'll just read some questions from the chat. I'm not sure if you can see them. We have one uh, question. In case of multi arms, the ideal should be to insert both interventions and divide the participants of the control group. Um, so in other words, what, what is the ideal in multi arm trials? Uh, how would you treat them? So honestly, um, I think that those questions are difficult and, and are open to, to debate. Uh, but the way that I see things, um, let's take, for example, the case of multiple arms um, that receive different doses. And the reason I'm picking that is because we now have, you know, the recent example of the vaccine trials where some people received one dose and some people receive uh, two doses, right? So would it be reasonable to take the effectiveness of the one dose and the effectiveness of the two doses and divide it that by two? Would that be the fair indication of the effectiveness of the vaccine? You understand what I'm saying? So the reason why we do dose response studies is to find the arm with the optimal dose. And then we consider that the dose, the optimal dose of that treatment is that, is that optimal dose found in the dose response study, right? That's how we view, for example, the vaccine trials. We consider that the optimal dose is the two shots. Um, the same thing goes with dose response studies of antidepressants. Imagine, for example, if you have three different arms receiving three different doses, and what you find is that one of the three arms produces the optimal therapeutic effect. Would you then consider that as the dose of the drug, or would you average across the different doses? May I, Isaac, may I ask a question? 
Absolutely. So, Patty, uh, this is Lucas from Dr. Moher's guru, uh, and congrats for the uh, amazing talk. Uh, I think you threw all, all of those steps in which we can bias uh, meta-analysis uh, and protect the bias as well. Uh, I'm not a mental health expert, but um, uh, in my clinical epidemiology training, in my meta-analysis meta training, I would like I would like to comment uh, two things with you and ask your uh, opinion on that. Um, if it, it could solve at least uh, a bit of problem uh, within trials and um, meta-analysis uh, in mental health. First of all, um, they standardize our mm, differences. Um, they, um, I know they are, why they are, uh, they are necessary, uh, mostly for meta-analysis. Also, you are dealing with multiple uh, and different scales, um, but if in the in the eligibility criteria you can um, put more boundaries to uh, restrict to the same tool, uh, it may be uh, diminish uh, bias, and moreover give to the um, uh, stakeholder um, a more clinical um, uh, and valuable information rather than uh, an SMD. And aside of some statistical points, I wouldn't uh, address right now, no. And the other thing is that, um, for example, I don't know, you, you probably follow the, I saw that you, you um, uh, showed um, a trial of uh, Pink Kuipers. Um, network meta-analysis, they, they are usually working with remission and not remission and not scores. So um, like dichotomization of outcomes uh, uh, in treating with, deal with in, uh, categorical outcomes rather than continuous outcomes. So I know that's kind of biased as well because it's highly dependent of the physician, um, the judgment of the physician but um, uh, it may reduce when you have like a bunch of um, uh, scales and you, you need to deal with the, those bunch of scales. Uh, I, I don't know if you like could go better with uh, our relative risk or odds ratio or, or something like that, you know, uh, rather than in a continuous output. What is your opinion? So, yeah, I, I have a very brief answer. So in my mind, um, the, the meta-analysis of the style that I just showed using a continuous outcome, I think is probably should be the, the focus. I view the uh, others focusing on, for example, just the, the Beck depression inventory scores or focusing just on the Hamilton rating scale for depression scores or focusing on remission versus non-remission dichotomous outcomes, I see those as sub-analysis within the analysis that can be used as communication devices for clinicians. And I'm all for it and that has been done. I didn't talk about this in this presentation, but those kinds of secondary analysis or sub-analysis within the main, the main meta-analysis, those have been done and are being done, uh, but I see them as, as communication devices. Th this doesn't address, I think, the more essential questions of data integrity, how do you define you know, inclusion, exclusion criteria, uh, the integrity of uh, methodological quality assessments, you know, those are, I think, more fundamental, more important uh, questions, at least from the standpoint of the researcher um, on this side of the aisle. And thanks for citing consort as well. Sure. Thank you for that. We have a couple questions in the chat and also a few people in the queue from direct messages. Thanks for the really interesting talk. Forgive the cynic in me, but any overt links to pharmacy funding 
uh, or pharmaceutical funding for authors of the reviews? So I, I didn't point it out, but uh, some of you who were looking closely might have seen uh, that the uh, 2011 meta-analysis by Dr. Crow was funded by AstraZeneca. And interestingly enough, when then Dr. Crow gave interviews summarizing the findings and claiming that there's no evidence that exercise uh, should be used in a clinical setting for the treatment of depression, Dr. Crow said that he had no conflicts of interest. So I think that here there's a little bit of gray area because sometimes what you have to sign to declare no conflict of interest is whether you have a financial relation to products that are mentioned or tested in the article. That would be exercise. So of course, then no, we don't have any commercial attachment to exercise. But if you are receiving funding from an entity that produces one of the leading antidepressants and you are researching exercise, do you or don't you then have a financial conflict of interest? So there's a little bit of a, of a gray area there. Thank you. And uh, Professor Brand? Well, actually, my question was answered with Patty's last answer. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Uh, the next question is from Leighton Jones. The NHS stepped care model includes exercise as treatment for mild depression. What are your thoughts on exercise as treatment for more severe depression? So I didn't, I didn't show the additional slides, but since 2010, actually the NHS includes exercise, not just for mild depression, but for subthreshold mild and moderate depression. So this actually adds up to the vast majority of patients seen at the primary care level. Now, do physicians with, within the NHS recommend or bring up physical activity as a treatment option? The answer is no, there is no evidence to indicate that that is even discussed. Uh, physicians don't bring it up. Uh, if you have friends working at the NHS at the primary care level, you can quiz them and it's funny because they've never heard of it. They've never heard of physical activity. Um, <clears throat> now for more severe, um, it hasn't been really tested. Uh, I would imagine uh, that uh, physical activity could be an adjunct for a uh, severe case of depression. Um, but we need more evidence. Uh, also, I should mention another category that should be investigated more is the people who are given the frontline treatments at this point, which is antidepressants, and don't respond. Right now, the treatment is augmentation or switching, right? Either you add another uh, antidepressant, a second on top of the first, or you switch them to a different antidepressant. And a suggestion that has been tested only in a couple of studies is what if instead of augmentation or switching, you use exercise as a uh, second treatment. We need more evidence on that as well. Thank you. The next question from Ben Jane. The degree to which physicians actually recommend or prescribe exercise for depression would seem to vary a lot and is often more to do with personal belief than interrogation of the evidence. Unfortunately, the biggest lobby groups of exercise are not using good quality evidence either. Is it a problem with who is best placed to get the big research funding for these problems? I think it's a multi-layered uh, problem. Um, I agree with the premise of the question. Um, that is consistent with my observations. Um, one thing that needs to happen, and that was frankly the, the motivation uh, for me giving this perhaps highly controversial presentation, is that there needs to be some organized entity um, that every time something like what I showed is published, is placed in a position to quickly issue a response. Right now, there is no official organized kinesiology entity that issues any kind of reply, any kind of critique when 
phenomena like this appear in the medical literature. So we are definitely losing the communication war. And I think that that's a big part of the, um, of the picture. Thank you. The next question is from Jorge Teixeira. What is usually a placebo intervention in the trials that you have mentioned? Do you think it is okay to compare exercise versus placebo pooled together with trials of exercise versus nothing? This would be an extension of the scenario of exercise plus drugs versus drugs that you have mentioned. So the, the placebo that I mentioned, um, I hope that I did uh, use the phrase uh, pill placebo when I mentioned it. So in, in the couple of cases, it was pill placebo. So pill placebos are, I mean, by all admissions, um, the, the strongest form of control because it controlled for something extremely important, especially in the case of exercise, which is the uh, expectancy of benefit, right? The expectation of benefit. So I, I would like to see more pill placebo exercise RCTs um, if no, for no other reason, because <clears throat> it will put the evidence at the same level as the evidence for <clears throat> pharmaceuticals. And it will also allow for more network meta-analysis in the future. We, right now, we, as I mentioned, we only have two trials comparing exercise to pill placebo. So it's not really easy to do a network meta-analysis. Um, unfortunately, we have no such thing as exercise placebo. People have tried and have failed. So that, that's not gonna work. Okay, so we have uh, several more questions questions in the chat. I'm going to do two more chat questions before going to the person with the hand raised. The next question comes from Steve Petrozello. Patty, these issues have obviously been made very insightfully by you in particular. Why, are, why aren't these issues corrected in the Cochrane Review? Is it, uh, it is updated periodically, so why are no changes made? I, um, I wish I had more insight about that question. So one uh, observation that I'm making is that the uh, first edition of the Cochrane Review was published in 2009. The second edition was published in 2013. So that's only four years apart. Compared to uh, the new trials from 2009 to 2013, we now have an overwhelmingly uh, larger number of trials that have been added since 2013, but we haven't had an update. So uh, I think it is reasonable to suspect that my analysis of the 2013 Cochrane might have something to do with it, uh, but I'm not sure because I'm not obviously privy to any uh, of the internal discussions within the Cochrane group. Um, th there is so much more to say about this. Uh, you know, the, the, the reason why I'm, I'm doing these talks and I'm doing critical appraisal workshops around the world is because I want more of us to start reading these uh, papers very closely. And I haven't seen a trend. I've seen a trend of people, you know, minding their own business and publishing their own things, but there is no trend, apparently no interest from anyone to say, Wait a minute, you know, the, 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 the things that are published in the most prestigious medical outlets, we're talking the British Medical Journal, we're talking about the Cochrane collaboration, the most, you know, prestigious high profile entities um, in the medical research world, those go unchallenged. And I, I think I just showed you that there are some very serious concerns about the integrity of that work. So I, I hope that, you know, others, who have an interest in this area, uh, join me, uh, contact me, uh, so that we can, uh, you know, maybe respond more effectively uh, in the future. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Ashley Woods. Uh, would you say a good approach to shining light on this issue is to focus on creating more research as well as reviewing published articles that may have error to allow physical activity to be prescribed to depressed individuals? Yes, both. I think both approaches. So 
I, I've mentioned that we, we have, you know, a increased rate of production of new material, new RCTs. And thank goodness the trialists have now become more sophisticated and they know that they should specifically mention the consort, you know, phrases, because these are the key phrases that are um, searched uh, by the meta analysts, right? You have to say, you know, how you concealed your, your allocation. You have to be explicit about intention to treat. Don't use different terms. Use those exact identical terms that are used in the consort guidelines, right? But in addition to that, what I'm calling for <clears throat> through this presentation and other means is that we also need to address the problems in uh, published research, research that has been published already, because they continue to be cited at a high rate. Thank you for that. And I'm sure Ashley will uh, put this advice to good use in class. The next question is from <laughs> Aphrodite Stathy in the... Uh, with Close the enough, Zach. Close enough. <laughs> I apologize. I yes, Aphrodite. I apologize. And thank you very much for your talk. And all of the issues raised are very important. I would like to, to stay to what I always see as the heart of the intervention, that is the exercise or what we deliver, what we administer. And you, you presented very nicely some real issues about what is classified as what in terms of exercise or, or, or relaxation, which makes me wonder uh, where in the process we can make differences for the actual exercise or the interventions protocols to be very detailed and in the open and published. So people can very quickly and see, uh, quickly see what is administered to whom. And not only the summaries of this is relaxation or this is a, a comparison group and that is not exercise. When you obviously, from what you described today, Actually, even groups that are uh, administered uh, relaxation, actually they were administered exercise components. So how, how we can make this process more transparent? Yes, so the, the problem that you're, you're raising actually started with us, with kinesiology people and our own biases. So back in the day, uh, exercise was aerobic exercise and non-exercise control was resistance, right? Which now blows our mind, right? How were we thinking along those terms? But that's how people thought back in the day that aerobics was the main thing, right? Then, interestingly enough, exercise, aerobic exercise was exercise and yoga became the non-exercise control. And then what did we find from that? That yoga is at least as effective, if not more, than the aerobic exercise. So then out goes that. And now we have the variations that you're looking at, the stretching that's not really stretching, the relaxation that's not really relaxation, right? So um, I, I hope that, uh, that people within kinesiology at least have learned their lesson and now understand that exercise is broader than what we thought in the 60s and the 70s and that there is full documentation of what the exercise protocols involved. Thank goodness we have online supplements, we have protocol papers, we have a lot of means to be very detailed about the interventions that were used. Those options did not exist 20 years ago, but we have that opportunity now, so we should take it. Thank you. Another, another uh, comment in the chat now, I believe is a follow-up to the question earlier about depression severity, indicating that there are at least three trials with patients, mostly with mo moderate to severe depression, few trials, but there's some evidence that exercise works for people with more severe episodes. Another question, regarding mild to moderate debate, I was wondering what your opinion is as to whether we have more obligation to suggest exercise to those with moderate depression with the belief that it will help some of these or whether we should resist suggesting exercise until we are certain that it will definitely help. With, with moderate depression? 
That's how I read the question. That's how I, I heard the question too. So let, let's be realistic here. I mean, I don't know how much more evidence there could be. Um, you know, you, you can make claims about the methodological quality. I was looking at the latest, <clears throat> for those of you in the field, the, the Cipriani 2018 um, mega meta-analysis of, um, of um, antidepressants. The, the, the trials that were rated of, of high quality were, were a small fraction. So it's, when you hear, you know, we don't have evidence because the quality is so poor, this is the exact same statement that you can make for uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and for antidepressants, right? Methodological problems will exist. When you look at the volume of uh, evidence, not just the quality, but the volume of evidence. How, how, what, what number is enough? At this point, I would estimate that we probably have over 50 RCTs, um, could be 60. Uh, so how, how many more are we gonna do? I mean, these involve thousands of people. Things have received FDA approval with less. So I don't think it's a, it's a question so much of either quantity or quality of evidence. We have several comments uh, that are very praiseworthy. Here's one of those comments saying that controversial presentations are exactly what is needed in today's world. This is particularly important in cases like this when something potentially free such as exercise competes with something that is multi-million dollar industry such as antidepressant drugs. The next question, great talk as expected. Wouldn't, be, wouldn't there be a socializing aspect, meeting new people, making friends of exercise that is also contributing to these benefits of exercise that is not controlled for in these studies? It is not controlled for in most of the studies, but there have been exceptions. Uh, there have been trials in which the exercise took place in social isolation. For example, the uh, Andrea Dunn trial that I mentioned, um, people were in a cubicle looking at a, at a barren wall uh, and, and they showed antidepressant benefits. So I would imagine that uh, insofar as the, uh, the social interaction is positive, because there's always the possibility that people are actually intimidated or um, displeased by the presence of others, uh, insofar as the social interactions are positive, that can contribute to the effect of exercise. And I agree that from a, um, you know, an experimental uh, standpoint, uh, we should absolutely try to uh, disentangle the effects of exercise from social interaction. Uh, but I think there has been evidence that even in social isolation, uh, exercise has an antidepressant effect. There's a plug for your uh, recent paper in Kinesiology Review, Volume 10, February 2021, uh, that is outlining these concerns. Another comment, uh, the impact of being in a group has not been mentioned yet, and I think it deserves to be recognized. The NHS guidance actually says physical activity interventions in groups are the recommendation. Do you have any comment or response to that? Yeah, my only comment on that was that wasn't really uh, so much evidence-based, that aspect of it, the, the, sort, the group, it, it had more to do with uh, efficiency. Um, for people who don't know within the NHS, you can have a prescription from your physician, you go to a local gym, you give your prescription to somebody who is uh, paid by the local community or some source, uh, and they're supposed to issue an exercise prescription for you so to the extent that they can do that within a group setting, uh, I think that that makes you know, the whole enterprise more cost efficient. So it's not that the, the evidence review uh, by NICE involved any particular contrast between exercise in isolation compared to exercise in a social setting. I think they added the group just for um, cost efficiency reasons. And I believe the last question in the chat comes from Dr. Lynette Kraft. Are our implementation science colleagues working on this? 
As you mentioned, there's plenty of support for the effect. Do we need more information on implementation? Absolutely. Um, I, I couldn't um, uh, agree with that sentiment more enthusiastically. Um, I, I, I feel I need, as we are winding this down, I feel I need to address one uh, issue here. And that is that physicians oftentimes say that I wouldn't uh, bring up exercise because people with depression don't want to exercise. And, and that may sound uh, on the surface of it uh, reasonable, uh, but I don't think it's, it's fully accurate. A lot of people with depression who have been given and have tried antidepressants didn't really experience benefits and experienced side effects instead. So there is a growing number of people that are now in this category of looking for non-pharmacological options for the treatment of their depression, mostly as a result of the high cost or the side effects of having tried antidepressants. So when you know that the alternative is antidepressants, I think you may be more motivated to try exercise. So don't automatically, especially for people with mild and moderate symptoms, don't automatically assume that people with depression will say no to exercise. That is not, I think, a fully justified assumption to make. A related question to that is now in the chat. Along with that question from Dr. Kraft, if we want to implement these findings, don't we need the field of exercise physiology and exercise psychology to be considered as part of healthcare? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that that's a rhetorical question. So uh, I'll play along and say, yes. Okay, that's all the uh, questions that I'm seeing in the chat. So thank you to everyone who's had questions. Thank you to Patty. Um, any last comments from Patty, Vanessa? Thank you very much. Um, and we'll be announcing our, the continuation of our series. If Patty wants to take us out, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I have nothing insightful to say other than uh, to repeat my, my call. Um, don't remain passive. If you feel that this is an important issue uh, then contact me. Um, let's uh, see if we can um, make some kind of, um, I don't want to call it a quick reaction force, uh, but, but some kind of organized group that can put together um, critiques or responses every time we see that there are um, reasons to be concerned about the quality of the evidence regarding exercise that is being published in the medical research literature. So that's all. Thank you to Stork uh, once again for this tremendous opportunity. Um, we had a good crowd and I hope that something uh, tangible eventually will come out of this. Thank you. All right, be well, everyone. Thank you guys. Have a nice day.